of Dora. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Hey, good morning, good, my brother. Good evening. <laughs> is it is it midnight? It's about oh, two minutes to midnight. Oh my! <laughs> wow! You look like you got the sun shining out there already. It is. It's coming up. I can see it through your front door. Really? Oh my! It's just light. Yeah. 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 Should I move that screen just uh, six inches? Uh. Or tilt your camera this way, maybe, just in case you move your hands out. Oh, here. That's it. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. <laughs> wow. How's your week been, brother? Full on? It's been fine this week. Uh, the, the grandchildren spent the last couple of nights with us, and they just left, and uh, they went to school. They go to a Christian school, okay. uh, you might remember me saying. Anyway, uh, what... Uh, what was the background that we are? Where are we at? I, I was thinking a wedding feast would be good. Or, I don't know. Well, uh, maybe we can do that next week. We're, right now, we're sitting in front of an observation deck. And if you look out there, we're like in the middle of the galaxy somewhere. There's oh, a, there's like in a all, space station. Yeah, we're on an observation deck of some, uh, probably the same space shuttle you were preaching on in that uh, final solution. Yes. Yeah. Wow. What so, an enormous craft. Yeah. There's all sorts of things floating. You know all the technical terms, all these things that we're seeing. So I just call it space. <laughs> yeah, the galaxy, the yeah. various things. The, the most beautiful things, I, I think, in creation are the nebula or nebulae. That's probably uh, Latin, isn't it? Anyway, the uh, gases that are lit up by the luminous little young stars, you know, and wow. <laughs> so, what, what was it we were going to discuss today? You want to talk about prophecy? Yeah. Well, we, before we get into that, I wanted to ask you one last thing about the, um, the pyramids. When you were saying a couple of weeks ago that the, uh, the pyramids at Giza and the, the Sphinx and all that, they were 2,000 years older than the other wonders of the world. Do you know approximately where that, where, how old they would be then? When, when were they built approximately then? Well, that's a good, a good question. And uh, I lean heavily in, in the area that the Great Pyramid and the other two lesser pyramids, those three were built long before the flood by beings that existed during the uh, Noahic period or even before Noah because of the fact that they are much different and they have longevity. But you see, if the flood happened in the year of the world around 1656 or that many years since Adam and Koah lived in the garden, so approximately the year 15, uh, 1656, the flood happened and then of course that you're moving out of the flood into the descendants of Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and uh, uh, various rebellious things that went on there. And then Abraham comes along a few hundred years later. Then uh, we have the civilizations being built that we call Mitzrayim or Egypt and the peoples of uh, Chaldea, Syria uh, that developed later. And uh, so estimating when they were built, it would have to, they would have to have been before the flood, because if they were 2,000 years older than the other six wonders of the ancient world, 
And that they, when they estimate that, they just guess. They aren't saying, well, they, they were built at this time. It was probably, they were probably built over a long span of time, however, very carefully by other beings, but, you know, I mean, other peoples. But the thing of it is, these other things were at least 2,000 years newer. So that doesn't mean that they weren't 4,000 years, uh, or not maybe four, because then they'd be before creation, wouldn't they? But we have uh, these ancient items built by, say, the Greeks or the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, you know. And so we know Babylon was, uh, you know, built by Nimrod. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was a king that carried the southern tribes, of Ye the, the tribe of Yehuda, into captivity. Of course, uh, that, that uh, was a long process in itself. They, we always think of the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C. as, a, as an event that uh, everything happened in that one year, but it didn't. They were actually being carried into captivity by small battles and as many as 10,000 people would be taking it, taking it once, just snatched out of the city of Jerusalem, uh, even before the, uh, you know, the sixth century had arrived. Uh, Ezekiel, or Yehaskel, and Daniel and his little buddies, they were taken away long before the temple, you know, 20, 30 years before that, the temple was destroyed. So, in, in fact, they were hearing about the temple. They were in Babylon, you know, like Ezekiel or Yehanskel and Daniel and all those, they were hearing about their own their their homeland and their city of Jerusalem being destroyed from Babylon. That that was the news was reaching them, and uh, people tend to not know about that. But uh, as far as the pyramids, though, the uh, I mean, we don't know who built them. We don't know why they built them. But they don't. We don't know the purpose of them. We don't really know. Uh, when they were built, you know, but we uh, we do know that they were at least 2,000 years older than the other six wonders of the ancient world. That's about all we can do. Now, when, we, when they were built, we don't know, but from the size of them, it must have taken, well, if it took Noah or Noah a hundred years to build the ark, you know, I imagine that it took, um, just guessing, four or five hundred years possibly to build those pyramids. Wouldn't you imagine? Wow. So if they were trying to build them to uh, protect themselves, like a fort, they, mm -hmm. uh, they're, obviously, they're obviously expecting to live a lot longer if it was going to take them 500 years to build this thing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. They must have been planning it. <clears throat> of course, people can modify their plans, but, uh, you know, the, some people have said that the new Yerushalayim is going to be modeled after the, after the pyramid design. I don't necessarily believe that because I think that it describes walls and a cube is more likely. The, but we know it's going to have a square pattern, you know, but we don't know exactly, uh, well, we know it's going to be enormous. <laughs> but uh, the, right now, the largest structure made by mankind in the history of the world, by far, is the Great Pyramid. They call it the Pyramid of Cheops, but uh, he was just, his name was put on it, I guess. But you know, I don't I don't think he had anything to do with it. <laughs> they put their names on a lot of stuff, you know, like okay, my name's going on that, you know, because people are always about uh, you know power and uh, you know the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When they hear that, the pride of life has to do a lot with the uh, fact that people want a name for themselves. And that, in fact, that's one of the things that they built uh, the great uh, the Tower of Babel for, to create a name for themselves. There was a nation building, and we need a name for ourselves. We need to make people really sh shudder and go, oh boy, those people are those people, and we're going to have to watch out for those people. And then they you know, build up these iconic images of themselves and instill fear in others. Um, you know. Anyway, there, to answer the question, though, uh, there is not really an answer that can be given, yeah. except to know that they were at least 2,000 years older. Hmm. You know? 
Could be, uh, could be more though. You're saying could be three. Oh, yeah. It could have taken them a thousand years to build them. You know, mm. I mean, think about that. I mean, you, you, Noah took a, a you know, a, and I'm sure Noah and his his sons weren't the only ones working on the project. I mean, that but that big giant ship had to have been built by more than just three or four people, but you know. There's um, only eight people that are going to be on the boat, and the rest of them are animals, probably small animals, young. Some of them are uh, probably uh, just, you know, a, a few weeks old or something, you know. Like, you wouldn't want to take these large, huge creatures into your ship and go, well, we're going to keep you alive for a year. How much are you going to need? You know, a lot of food, you know. <laughs> but uh, no doubt they were small. Mm. All these things that are written down for us, though, like in, what is it, Second Timothy, um, it, it just says that all scripture was inspired, or Elohim breathed, for our instruction, you know, and, and training and righteousness. And we're, uh, we're just basically looking at other things and saying, well, what about that? And, you know, we can make up imaginative ideas about them, but you know, the, the main thing that counts is what, what the prophets, you know, wrote down and and we have to follow that and those those uh, doctrines. Yeah. I got to, finally got around to watching your uh, death seminar today. Wasn't that amazing? Well, that yeah. it's it's amazing because I, I really just sort of uh, collect uh, things that he write he wakes me up in the middle of the night most of the time and I just scratch down the notes and 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 I don't uh, really see it coming together as a logical thing at all and then I just put it up and uh, it's just a bunch of notes and then uh, I present it and I don't have any rehearsal or uh, script or anything other than the fact that I'm reading the notes and that uh, is all it is and it's all Yahusha I don't have anything to do with it. I just don't know what, what it's going to be. Mm. But death is a very real and yet feared thing. But I think in the end, the final analysis is that when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that we are not alone. Mm. Now, most people are. Mm. But mm. we're not. See, and that's the amazing thing, that we would be chosen like that, you know. Yeah, when you um, read Psalm 23, it affected me how it affected you. I thought on the table, yeah. uh, you were emotional. I thought it just showed, uh, it showed me how, I mean, we all get waves of it sometimes, but it showed me just how um, busy in life you can become. And I just I just saw you and I thought how uh, reliant, and particularly over the last, after the last year, I just saw how that affected you and I thought, I want to go closer. I want to go further into that place, you know, where you, all that matters is him, you know. Yes. He's the yes. only one that's going to be with you at, at the end. Well, you know, that's uh, what I was wondering myself is why was I overcome at that point in reading that? I was, um, it wasn't really me. Uh, I, I, I never want to be the one. In fact, when I pray before I give one of those seminars, I ask him to let me just just sort of be a vessel and let him be the one to say things. I don't have anything to say, but he has. And uh, when I was reading that section of the teaching on death about the resurrection of Eleazar, and it said, and I, and I mentioned the shortest verse that Yahushua mm -hmm. wept, and that he wasn't just weeping for out of sympathy for the people around him, but he was weeping for all mankind and the fact that they have to endure this. And um, this is so sad to him. Uh, and then reading that psalm, I think he was coming back into that same frame of mind because he was, it was reflecting that, you know. If you read that psalm, it's just all about death, you know, the valley of the shadow of death. And, uh, Fear no evil, for you are with me, you know. Uh, he gave me that psalm very shortly. I think it was the, the night before the lecture. 
or for the seminar. So I had no idea that that was even going to be in there. <laughs> and then he then he brought it, and I said, "Okay, well, that can't not be there. It has to be there." So and then you know, of course, it was at the very end too. You know. See, you see the progression of it. Yeah. You know. He's doing everything. Yeah, he's doing it all. We all we have to do is just get out of his way, stop trying to steer things and control things, and just let him do it. But uh, yeah, because it's funny when you're uh, when you're in the assemblies and stuff, they try and they read the psalms and oh, it's lovely and they're pretty and they you know all the psalms and sila and yeah, that's where we get all our wonderful praise and worship. So when you actually read the psalms, they're like. Good old Dawood, yeah. Dawood, he's just in agony. He's like, when are you going to kill him? Go and kill him. They're wicked. Kill him. You know, kill him. Die, die, die. You're like, this is not pretty at all. He's just in agony. He's been battered <clears throat> about and everyone's hunting after him. And Yeah. Often, you get a lot of strength in that, don't you? Yes, you do. And, uh, you know, I, I tell you what, that uh, that's, thing that uh, I think it, it was uh, when he was facing the giant, you know, and a lot of people have the giant to face. and But the real giant that we're, that we're facing is, you know, overcoming Self. the flesh, ourselves, yeah. And uh, the Goliath we see as, a, as somewhat outside, but it isn't. It's a, we have a Goliath in us that we have to overcome, you know. We're, we're in a battle. In fact, the next, well, you are willing, the next seminar I thought was going to be on the immersion. But immersion is a is a more of a conscription point. It's when you join the service. It's like you know, there's the Navy or there's the Army or the Air Force. I'm going to join one of these branches of the military. And at that point that you take your pledge. Go and enlist. We're going to enlist. That's what immersion is. And but you see the bigger the bigger scheme is is what I'm going to try to address, and that's the war in heaven. The war in heaven is a much bigger thing, and that's what wow. we're and we're enlisting to fight in. See, so there's a battlefield, and most people are unaware that there's a battle. Hmm. They don't even they don't hear it, they don't see it, and yet it is. It's there. In fact, it's, I was just talking to my grandchildren this morning about the, uh, nine, uh, well, the nine fruits of the Spirit, that if we try to obey in our own flesh, we'll fail, uh, because our flesh just wants to do whatever it wants. But when we are controlled by the Spirit of the Messiah, the Mashiach, He is in charge, and then the nine fruits of the Spirit are what everybody sees. It's, it's all about loving Yahuwah and loving your neighbor, and that's what the Torah teaches us. The Torah is an uh, instruction that enables us to understand what love is, and that it's not about self. And that's where the fall happened, or the failing happened for Hashatan, because he was all about himself. And, you know, the war in heaven started with basically the idea that he was number two, and he was seeing the, the worship that was given to number one. <clears throat> and he wanted that. In fact, they didn't really differentiate too much between him and Yahuwah. And he was thinking, wow, all I have to do is just shift things a little bit, and I'll be getting it. And that's what's happened. And people don't see it. They, that's why you hear him saying, well, it doesn't matter that much what I call him. Well, it does, because he's not allowed to use the name. But he is allowed to use the same principles, you know, so he can yeah. appear righteous. Yeah, you said at one point during the seminar today that uh, there were two points. I forget what you're saying, but one of them was by not using his, by taking away his name, you're taking away his identity. I hadn't thought of it like that. I know his yeah. name is important, but his name is who he is. It's his identity. You're taking away Yahusha. And, you know, what's happened is actually the adversary's name is what's really been taken away. Because he, the adversary will take any name except the one. He can't have that one. Just like, uh, you know, the Sabbath is one day of the week. But if, if you're told that, well, it doesn't really matter which day you choose, then 
you know, but what if you chose the right one? Well, then that dragon gets upset. Well, you, we don't want you to choose the right one, but choose these other ones. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's an identity thief. That's what he is. And we've been telling people that for years. Yeah. So war. war the war world. again. Yes. It's because there's it a it's, song about uh, war, isn't there? Was that uh, war? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Now, that, that, was, that, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the group war. war. There is a group called war that, you know, uh, you know, like. Uh, what is it good for? Low, low rider and all those uh, Cheech and Chong things. Uh, <laughs> there's a. Uh, oh, boy. The uh, war was uh, Otis or. Uh, no, let me. I can find that real quick. Um, <laughs> war. The song war, you know. I know the name. I just can't think of it. Let's see. We'll just we'll just Google that. Google it. That's Google. Yeah, that's what my wife always says. She says, "Oh, go just ask Google. Google knows." <laughs> Song, war. Yeah, there it is. Oh, Edwin Star. It's E D W I N, and then Star S T A R R. Okay. Yeah. Well, wow, that war, yeah. Well, maybe we can use that for some of the soundtrack then. Yeah. And we can yeah. change the lyrics. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll make a note to write some new lyrics for Yeah, write some new lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So for people who are going through the uh, scriptures and they're reading it from the beginning again, sometimes it can be a bit of an arduous task because we've all been programmed, a lot of us have been programmed that the uh, Old Testament is just a bit boring, um, unfortunately, that, that, that's the way we've been programmed a lot of the time. Who wants the old when you can have the new? Um, so I thought we, we should go through the, um, the prophets. I think there's about 16 or so books of the prophets from uh, Yeshayahu. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, I thought if I could get you to give us a brief rundown of who wrote the, the book uh, and who, who the prophet was mainly talking to, like which tribe they were talking to uh, and whether they'd been fulfilled or not. Just so when we read through it, we can sort of get a picture of, okay, that's, that's what... That's why we're reading all this. It means this, and it's it is for us, or it's for them, or it's. Yeah. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, the prophets were prophesying, and they were saying all basically, you know, the the same thing. But they were trying to get Israel to get back on task, you know, because they were trying to get the leadership of whatever reign they were under to listen to Yahuwah again, because they fallen away from him. But, uh, you know, and they were giving warnings of what was going to happen in the future, and some of them were whipped and in prison, like Yahu or Jeremiah, you know, and, but, uh, you know, basically, uh, Well, let's start at Yeshayahu, if you want. Who, well, Yahoo was where I started out. I uh, opened up the scriptures for the first time, and there it was chapter 53, Isaiah, or Yeshayahu 53. But uh, he was just, you know, an amazing one. He's like a super prophet. Uh, you know, he, well, you know, if there is one, because there's so many things that he predicted. And, uh, you know, in chapter 7, you know, the, um, was it, um, and then chapter 9, you know, uh, Emmanuel and uh, the virgin birth, uh, you know, the fact that this is going to be a miracle. But, um, you know, when I identify with Yeshayahu so much because uh, when he said, I am undone, I have seen the, the, the Kodesh one, you know, I just, I understand what he's saying because I didn't see, I haven't, well, I have kind of seen Yahushua, but it was, uh, you know, just light. But um, I didn't have all those experiences that he did. But Yeshayahu was amazing. Um, 
he lived, uh, you know, concurrently or what they, you know, with, when they when they talk about uh, his contemporaries, he lived with other prophets like Amos, Hosh, Hoshu, or they call him Hosea, um, Micah. These are people that lived along with him. And he was kind of living, you know, he took on his ministry around 740 BCE before, just shortly before, the Assyrians carried away the northern tribes. So his prophecies were, even though he was a, you know, a person that was living in the southern kingdom, as I, as I understand, he was prophesying about the northern tribes. So his prophecies were to all Israel, I mean, both both kingdoms, because uh, they had been divided by that time, you know, after, after Solomon or Slomo, the kingdoms were divided uh, through after his son. But, um, you know, Yeshayahu was, uh, I think he started his reign under King Uzziah, and, and then Hezekiah, which uh, you rem people re might remember Hezekiah, the king, and he had uh, received a letter from one of the messengers from the Syrians, and he laid it down in the temple before Yahuwah so that Yahuwah could see what he said, and it was horrible. And, uh, you know, he had a lot of uh, interesting ways of describing things, like personifications of things that no other prophets used. And even though some people say there were two, some people say there were two Isaiahs, or Yeshiahs, but those are the people that are not so much uh, in tune with the scriptures. We understand there was just one. And that, see, they think that the book is so long, 66 chapters, that there must have been two, but there wasn't, even though parts of it are written in different script. The same but, people, uh, same people who say there's three or four Elohims. Yeah. <laughs> Trinity or <laughs> quadrinity or whatever it is. <laughs> Duality, yeah. <laughs> But uh, there's only one Yeshiah, as far as I know. And uh, anyway, the the fact is, he he'd say things like the trees clap their hands, and you know the uh, he calls Yahuwah a rock, you know, which is idiomatic or it's a metaphor, you know, it's uh, it's an idiom, you know, and he uh, had a love song that he wrote, you know, it was really Yahuwah singing or speaking. In the song, I think it was chapter uh, talks about the. I think it was chapter five. I wrote a note down here. The song of the vineyard is what it's called. You know, Israel is a vineyard to Yahuwah that He planted, and the vineyards, you know, gone astray. You know, it's just not producing the fruit. You know. But uh, Yeshiyahu was a wonderful prophet. He had a, he said in the last days that a banner would be lifted up. And that really grabbed me because of the visual idea of a banner, a signal being lifted up. And many people have seen this banner that I saw in my imagination was the menorah with the name in Paleo Hebrew above it and the two ba uh, fields of blue. And so I produced some flags and stickers and things that people have seen around on the internet and around the world now. I mean, they're all over the planet now. But uh, every time I see that, I think, yeah, that's uh, Yeshayahu chapter 11. You saw that you know? in a vision. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was thinking, well, the, the seal of Daoud or the, the name of Daoud in the middle of the star, the two triangles, uh, that's... Not, not important enough, but of course it does talk about the, in the prophecy, it says that, um, I think it's chapter 11, Yeshiyahu, that the root of Jesse, which means the offspring of Jesse, which is the Dawood, would, um, his, would be lifted up in the, in a, on a banner, and that's what we see today. But of course, the real kingdom isn't going to continue, continue probably with that. But although the throne of Daoud is, you know, the 
pass through, you know, the seed uh, of the tribe of Yehuda, the royal tribe. So uh, Yehusha is sitting on the throne of Daud when he comes back, which is really cool because the throne is something that's not going to stop. It's just, it's, it, you know, not necessarily the man Daud, but Yehusha is sitting on the throne of Daud. And when he's ha when he's in his earthly reign, you know, when he comes back. But uh, I think it was Yeshayahu also that, uh, you know, during the reign of Hezekiah, that uh, one messenger went out and slew all of the armies of Assyria that were encamped around Jerusalem, and that was amazing, you know. And. Uh, Anyway, during the uh, the time of Yeshayahu, there was so many things going on against with the Assyrians. You know that was their main enemy, and and it kind of remains that way even now. So I think that all these prophecies are and prophets are, you know, for all of us. It's not just for us. I mean, when you say, "Well, who are they speaking to?" Well, they were speaking to us too, because, you know. Because it, it well, there's a there's a text that we can go right to. It says right here, um, we have the um, yeah. I mentioned Second Timothy three sixteen that all scripture, all scripture, which means that it was written down to the prophets, was for our instruction and you know for and training in righteousness and so forth and. Uh, so the the who they're addressing is is really all of us, and they're it's for our example too. Yes. All the things that happened were so that we could learn by it, and you know, not many of us are even paying attention. But uh, yeah, when you said about the uh, messengers going and slaying all the people camped around Jerusalem, reminded me today in that seminar you were saying that. The four messengers are chained back. They're just waiting to come and just rip into the earth. I'd never heard it like that. And then you likened those four messengers to the four horsemen. I hadn't heard that before either. That's wonderful. I thought they were two different things. The four horsemen yeah. are, are those same four messengers that are being... You just don't picture it that they're being held back. They're just waiting, waiting to just come and slay a third of the earth. That was amazing. Yeah, they uh, they are waiting, and they're uh, the, and what happened there in miniature is going to happen globally. Mm. You know, that's what we have to remember. Now, the 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 prophet, the next prophet that I think is probably the second most important prophet is uh, Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah. Yeah, and you know he's the prophet of doom. You know the weeping prophet, uh, and chapter three really grabs you for the last days because it's all about the regathering, and you know the re not the regathering so much. Uh, well, it is that too, but Ephesians three talks about it as well. But uh, chapter three of Yirmiyahu, and um, you know there there's just so many things that Yirmiyahu ex explains. But uh, if we were to take the, um, well, I think his, his, the one that wrote a lot of it, see, people think the prophet wrote a lot down, and he probably did. In fact, he did write a lot of it, and I think the king that he went to tore it up and burned it and said, hey, we're going to just warm ourselves with this, but then he redictated it to his, his uh, scribe, Baruch. See, Baruch was uh, also another prophet, I believe, if he's not in the accepted canon, but he's in the books of the Apocrypha, but Baruch has a, a real level head on his shoulders, too. So we're talking about the scribe of Yerbyahu, and, um, you know. <clears throat> and uh, who was he mainly addressing? Was he addressing a particular tribe? Well, yes. Uh, he was also talking to the... Uh, you know, the, the people of uh, the southern tribes, mostly, you know, to warn them. He's explaining to them in one place about the, uh, didn't you see what happened to the tribes in the north? 
you know, or now here you are in the tribes of the South doing even worse. And then they're carried away, you know, during his life, lifespan, lifespan. But um, <clears throat> anyway, Daniel and, uh, and Ezekiel or Yehaskel, they're carried away uh, shortly after his prophecies. And, you know, and think, I wasn't it Daniel that was reading, uh, you're reading Daniel and you see that Daniel realized how long the, the captivity was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And he was reading Yermiyahu to get that. I forget where that chapter was. But, uh, I don't retain all these little details like you know, I should, but <clears throat> if, I, uh, if I had more time, I, I, I would be a recording device. But y Yermiyahu had, y well, Yahushua revealed to Yermiyahu how long the southern tribe, you know, the tri house of Yehuda would be in captivity. And Daniel picked up on that while he was studying his writings. So his writings were there in Babylon, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, all these prophets, they call minor prophets like Micah and, you know, Malachi and Nahum and Habakkuk, Obadiah. Uh, a lot of those people were contemporaries with uh, Yermiyahu. You know, well, not not Malachi, of course, but uh, Malachi when you, was. When you say contemporaries, what do you mean? Well, they lived right there with them. They knew each other. Okay. You know, hmm. you know. Yeah. Like uh, Yeshiyahu would have, he would have known Amos and H Hosea, or H Husha is what I call him, but. Hmm. You were talking about the uh, the dry bones and uh, Ezekiel in that seminar a lot. Dry bones, and you were saying that's the the house of Israel coming back to life again. Or... Yeah, yeah, it, it relates to the all the tribes. Uh, they're all dispersed into the world, and they're going to hear the call to come out of their graves. Uh, now, of course, we know there's going to be two resurrections, but most people are not prepared to hear about that because they haven't known about it. But they think that when Yahushua comes back, that's kind of like the end of it. But that's just the beginning because only a few are going to be coming out relative to the great number. But the people in the second resurrection are going to be faced with a horrible dilemma because all the people in the first resurrection are going to be fine, you know. But there's going to be incredible destruction. And the ones that are destroyed are going to wait for their resurrection. And then when they are resurrected, to, to determine whether they're in or out is going to be according to the scroll of life. But those bones, those dry bones, were a prophecy that, uh, you know, we read about. And it was a, it was a wonderful study to, to, read, to dig into the scriptures on the subject of death and resurrection. But uh, I focused on death more than resurrection, you know. So when you think, uh, when we're reading through the books of the prophets, um, even if, you know, there's talking specifically to a certain tribe, you think who they're talking to all the time is directly relative to us in these last days? Well, they are prophets, and prophets are... You know, it says in Re what is it? Revelation, the spirit of Yahusha is the well. The testimony of Yahusha is the spirit of prophecy. So, yes, they are talking to all of us. They're talking to everyone, not just uh, those in the covenant. I mean, we want them. We're trying to reach them, people outside the covenant, with the prophecies, because the the idea of prophecy is something that's predicted that will come true, but it's also a testimony, which in the Greek is mar martui, or something like that. Um, let's see, the word is um, marturia, marturia, and that word means a, well, it's where we get the word martyr. Mm. It's, a, it's a witness. It's, a, it's something that produces evidence for, like, legal evidence. 
evidence. So we're appealing, and the prophets appeal with legal evidence. So the prophets are speaking through the inspiration of Yahuwah, and they uh, testify, or marturia, give evidence, and then the people either accept the evidence or they say, okay, I'm not buying it. And then we have to, you know, that's what we are. We're, when Yahushua is in us, we produce the evidence, and then the people either accept it or reject it. So the spirit of prophecy is always in the world. You know, it's just a matter of us recognizing it. But uh, I think it's Revelation chapter, oh, uh, yeah, chapter 19, verse 10. The testimony of Yahushua is the spirit of prophecy. So I, I always, that popped out at me uh, a long time ago, and I realized that it was his speech, it's Yahuwah speaking, it's, or Yahusha is speaking through his people. And of course, a person can be used as a pro for prophecy. Even a donkey, as I was saying in my email to you, that a donkey can be used, Yahuwah can speak through a donkey. So uh, if he can speak through a donkey, he can speak through anybody. You know, yeah, you know, because there's an email uh, through the YouTube I think this week, and some brother had asked, uh, "Is Scripture still being written today through Yahushua's Spirit, like for future generation?" It was an interesting question. Uh, is Scripture still being written today? I, not fake Scripture, but I, uh, I would probably say no. <laughs> it's, it's I, I would, yeah. I wouldn't want to add or take away to, from his words. And that brings up issues like uh, Kabbalah or uh, the oral traditions written down called the Gemara and the Talmud. And there's people that will, you know, really get excited and emotional about those things. And yet they're no more than you and I sitting, sitting around and talking to one another, really. They're, right. they're, assessments. <laughs> they're, they're not scripture, they're assessments, they're uh, appraisals, they're saying, well, you know, and then there's things in there that you don't want to have, they're unmentionable, you know, they're, you, they're horrible, but then again, a lot of it is good interpretation too, but we don't want to study it, I mean, you can't find a place in any text of scripture, uh, inspired writings, where anybody quoted, uh, you know, a, a Talmud, or, well, it, wasn't, it didn't exist. But when you read the words, do not add to or take away from these laws, and then you read other text that says, uh, anyone who adds to these words or takes away from these words is going to receive the curse uh, that are in this book and the curses. So, uh, you know, you don't want to add like a Book of Mormon to this thing, you know, or... Uh, you, don't, you just don't want to do that. No. <laughs> That's one of the things that I left out, isn't it? Or did I? In my study on Nicolaitans. But uh, I didn't mention the Mormons very much. But, uh, mm. yeah. Do you want to add anything more to the, the problem? Do you want to go through them more specifically? Or do you think they're all sort of saying the main thing? Well, the, they're all basically saying the same thing. I, I wouldn't have um, the skill or the wisdom to just do it off the top of my head. All I have is general ideas, but I do understand uh, somewhat when they lived and where they lived. Um, Ezekiel was another interesting, uh, you know, prophet. But, um, and, and he would be by favorite as far as, um, you know, Yeshiyahu is number one in my book, because Yahuwah used him to speak to me, you know, originally. But that's where, that's where we get a fondness for any of our teachers. Is, uh, you know, we put a, one teacher ahead of another one because they were the first one to expose something to our minds and reveal truth to us. But it really wasn't that teacher. It was Yahusha that was behind it. And that's really all we have to concern ourselves with because when we put men into a ranking, you know, and say, well, this one was more important than that one, we're all members of one body. 
if you read Romans chapter 12, it, it kind of exhibits for us exactly what we're supposed to do, you know? And, um, and then Romans chapter 15. Those two chapters explain a whole lot about prophecy and, and how we're supposed to follow prophecy. Um, in, in just the context here, I'll start with cha uh, chapter 15, verse 1. But we who are strong in a, uh, ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. In other words, we're supposed to help our neighbors. Let each one of him uh, be able to build up his neighbors. For even the Messiah did not please himself, but as it has been written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So we're putting ourselves on the bottom. Now, here's chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written before, and this is the answer to the question, the central question, of uh, who the prophets were speaking to. For whatever was written before was written for our instruction, that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have the expectation. There it is. In other words, the faith. Our, the faith is, the belief is conveyed through what was written for our instruction. So it is directed all at everyone, you know, that will hear. Now, and then we have, uh, I want to look at chapter 12, because chapter 12 is, Romans chapter 12 describes exactly what a student or a disciple of Yahushua really is. It's, um, it, there's 20-something uh, verses here, I think, uh, 21. Yeah, but let's read it. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart and well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. For I say through the favor which has been given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he should, but to think soberly, as Elohim has given to each a measure of belief. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we, the many, are one body in Messiah, and members each one of one another. And having different gifts, according to the favor which was given to us, let us use them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of belief. If serving, in the serving. Or he who is teaching, in the teaching. Or he who encourages, in the encouragement. Or he who is sharing, in sincerity. He who is leading, in, diligent, in diligence. He who shows compassion, joyously. Let love be without hypocrisy. Shrink from what is wicked, cling to what is good. In brotherly love, tenderly loving towards one another, in appreciation, giving preference to each other, not idle in duty, ardent in spirit, serving the master, rejoicing in the expectancy, enduring under pressure, continuing steadfastly in prayer, imparting to the needs of the set-apart ones, pursuing kindness towards strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be proud in mind, but go along with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Repay no one evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, on your part, be at peace with all men. Beloved, do not revenge yourselves, but give peace to the wrath. For it has been written, vengeance is mine, I shall repay, says Yahuwah. Instead of your, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. In so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's, a, that's, that's us. Now, if we don't exhibit what that, what that exemplifies, then we're not a follower of Yahushua. 
we're a pretender. One of the things that people hear in this is heaping of coals of fire on their head. Uh, I've heard many, many different uh, takes on that, and it's kind of interesting. But uh, when you're embarrassed in front of other people, you feel this heat all around your upper area, your head. Sometimes it actually gets red. And that's what we call embarrassment, you know, being a blush. So that's just an idiom, I believe. So if you don't really, and then they have these uh, ideas of people walking around in a village with a bunch of coals on their head. And that's, uh, that's the literal, you know, no one uh, really did that, you know. But if they did, where'd that start? But the idea that a person is embarrassed and they feel this heat in their head area and they're blushing, that's really all it is. It's like when we, in, in our culture, we have this uh, idiom called being caught red-handed. You know, that would be like a thousand years from now, somebody saying, yeah, they found him and he had, his, he had a red hand. Well, <laughs> it's just... You know, it, it means that the blood was on his hand is what that means. You know, the red, being caught red-handed means that, well, the blood's on your hand. You must have been the one who did it. You know, but uh, that is a literal thing. But the coals on the head, I don't know. Uh, but heaping coals of fire on his head means that you're making him blush because of his. he's being ashamed of himself mm. for having been an accuser. Yeah. And, you know, Shame is a horrible thing to, to feel. And uh, I really think that, in all honesty, uh, some of the people that have been attacking the, the teachers and messianic groups, and very, they, it, it isn't just me that they're attacking. People are being attacked all the time by one another. And that, that always distressed me. I mean, all, ever since I ever saw the first parts of it on the Internet, I couldn't believe it was happening. You know, and I was so, you know, I, I didn't want to read it, you know, and it, it, because it is uh, libel. It's, it's slander. But uh, it seems like it's getting worse and worse. And I hear, I just got a call from a brother yesterday who's uh, being, you know, brought down by other, other believers. And some of it might be half truth. See, and other, but you see, it's being all one sided. So. Some of it is true, some of it isn't, but it isn't ever supposed to be couched or, or posed in the way that it's being posed, you know. So when you hear that stuff, just dismiss it and just don't read it, you know. It just corrupts you. It'll rot your bones, you know. Hmm. We, uh, we always understood that uh, hot coals scripture to mean, because he was saying, vengeance is mine, I shall repay. If you try and get people back, then there's no power in that. It's just you're just doing what they're doing. Whereas if you get get yourself out of the way, and I think the scripture says, "Is it bless those who persecute yeah. you?" Then Yahuwah will deal with that person. I think that's where we understood the hot coals came in. You'll see them walking away, where well, you won't see it, but you know, Yahuwah will deal with that person. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Do you, think uh, it's, you think it's more just embarrassment? More, most likely. Uh, yeah. But then, then who's to say uh, the, the uh, idioms of the ancient world are just, uh, we're, 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 we're really guessing about it, but most likely these Hebraisms and idioms are, you know, not they don't come across well in translation. And when we take literal calls and, and heaping our heads, uh, we might be misinterpreting some of the words. So I'd be very careful to, to think that it's a literal thing. It would be uh, possible that prof prophetically, like you were saying, that Yahuwah would be literally frying and burning these people down to ashes, and I think that's going to be the, the case. Yeah, they're going to be burned up. He says, if you, he says if you touch my anointed, look out. <laughs> yeah. You're Sorry. touching my, uh, my eyeball. They're the apple of my eye, as they say. Yeah. Well, as he says. So we don't want to touch the anointed, you know. Mm. <laughs> no way. Mm. But uh, I thought it was really interesting that, that Brother Paul, our beloved Brother Paul, 
would write that down in Romans 12 for us to show us. But, you know, the operation of the renewed covenant is uh, exemplified in chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans. In case anybody might be looking at it and they want to know. But there's, it's a treasure. You know, these, these things are awesome. And uh, I, I'm, I really don't have the, uh, the skill to answer every little detail about each prophet. But, of course, I do know a lot about each prophet. Like, you know, Hosea or Husha was, um, you know, married to, what, what was it, a, a harlot? Yeah. Uh, some kind of a, you know, and, um, one of the prophets, Yermiyahu, was told not to get married. You know, we don't think of these men as uh, regular people sometimes, but they were. They were just regular people, just like us, and they were just called to get to uh, to get and given a mission to accomplish and write down for our benefit. And there were probably prophets that were there that we don't even hear about now that didn't get recorded. You know, as we probably can realize is you know, possible. But uh, the main prophecies that were written down were for our benefit as we read in Romans. Mm. But uh, So are there any, are there many other, we've discussed this before, are there many other books that aren't in the canon that you would, uh, yeah, I know we've discussed this, you've said there's a few of them, but on your bookshelf, would you give credibility to many other what you say, the, the Apocrypha or something like that? What's the Apocrypha? Oh, boy. Uh, now, that, that's, a, that's a scary area to tread in. And a person can read books in the Apocrypha, and it's books generally thought of as being written between the time of Malachi and the arrival of Yahusha and uh, we're talking about a 400-year area of time when Yahuwah did not seem to be speaking to Israel through prophecy. But he had already put everything down, you know, and then just waited, and then he came. It was kind of like Malachi came, and then they were waiting for it, and then waiting for it, and waiting for it. And then the Messianic, uh, or the, the, the arrival of the Messiah, was almost like there was silence and everybody was, you know, that was studying scripture was thinking something's really about to happen here. You know, they could feel it, you know, because it was just deathly silence. You know, it was like the calm before a storm and it was really getting their attention. So there were a lot of false messiahs suddenly popping up going, I must be the one. And then, <laughs> and, and people misinterpreting things, you know. And even now, we have in our time, all these people that are popping up saying, I'm him. This one, the guy on the internet literally says he is. And then, of course, the, um, the, the, the uh, rabbis over there, uh, you know, think that you know, certain people are uh, are the Messiah, and they're waiting for him to resurrect. But um, you know, we're we're really seeing a lot of the same things that were going on during that time when there was nothing going on. There was no no prophecies, and then suddenly there's you know the message of Eliyahu is starting to be announced into the world. You know, that Yahuwah is Elohim, and uh, you know, that, that's a very interesting thing to be seeing. And now we're saying what Yahushua said that we would say, that we would not see him until we said Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahuwah. And now we're saying it. I'm driving home from work and I'm saying it. And I'm, <laughs> I'm saying it. Why? I don't know. I, I just have to say it. And uh, Blessed is and, the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, Psalm 118. Yeah. I might be wrong. I'm sleepy. I don't know. <laughs> but I know you're sleepy, too, because it's it past <laughs> midnight, 1 o'clock. Yeah. But, uh, so, yeah. do you, um, further down the list there, you've got uh, Yoel and Amos and Obadiah and Yona and Micah and Nahum and these. We don't hear too much about these. These ones there. 
Is there much story in there? Yeah, they're usually they're called the minor prophets, but they're very important to me, and uh, they are all once again for us. You know, they're uh, they're about the tribes of Israel that are lost and scattered into the nations, especially Jonah. You know, when I Jonah was, uh, you know, more of a messianic figure in the sense that Yahusha identified him as, uh, you know, the sign of Jonah was given. And people don't know what the sign of Yonah is really all about. And I was seeing Yonah as a man who was being instructed to go to Nineveh, which was a, literally the name means city of fish, Nineveh. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, which was the, the arch enemy of Israel. They were the ones that were attacking Israel and trying to overcome them. And Assyria was the last place that he wanted to go because he hated the Assyrians. And yet we're supposed to love our enemies. So Yonah was a prophet and he was told to go there. And so he says, ah, well, if I don't go, I'm going to die. But if I die and I don't go, then Yahuwah says that he will destroy Nineveh. And if Yahuwah destroys Nineveh, he's probably analyzing this and going, then that means that Israel will be safe. So as a matter of self-sacrifice, Yonah wants to disobey and knows that it's going to cost him his life. Ooh. Phyllis just held up the sign. One hour. <laughs> yeah. She sent in the dogs. <laughs> yeah, there's the dog, actually. The dog's, the dog's here, The too. dog is here as well. Send in the dogs. <laughs> yeah. Who, who let the dogs out? Um, so uh, Nineveh is, is a, the arch enemy of Israel. And so Yonah goes into the boat, and all these symbols are going on. Like he gets thrown into the, into the water, eaten or swallowed by a fish, a great fish, and then is vomited out three, three days and three nights later, which is the sign of Yonah, which is a resurrection. So we have Yahusha referring back to Yonah, and he identifies himself as a Yonah type in the type of one who would give himself for the sake of the nation. And, uh, and then three days and three nights later, he's, see, he, Yonah's prophecies de describing his experiences, his literal experiences, were uh, he was in the, you know, in the bottom of the ocean, you know, completely cut off in darkness and then three days and three nights later and it says three days and three nights not partials but fulls and then he's um, you know given that as the sign that he is the Messiah and so I think that's powerful and uh, it identifies the week that he was executed perfectly because the week that he was executed was that he was in the middle of the week, which is also a prophecy from Daniel, mm. because it was in, literally in the middle of the three and a half years, but it was also in you know the seventieth week of Daniel that the, that the Messiah was cut off, and and it was also in the in the very middle of a, of a real week, yeah. uh, seven days. So it was like bam, you know, double bam, <laughs> and then. And then three and a half days, uh, three days and three nights later, three days and three nights later, uh, Yahushua resurrects. And so that's the prophecy of the sign of Yonah. And uh, it's just a remarkable thing. So he, is that prophet important? Yeah. He didn't resurrect on a Sunday, did he? He actually resurrected, was it at the end of the Sabbath or? At the end of the Sabbath, and it was just as the sun was setting, and then he's comes up out of the wrappings and then goes through the uh, earth or the stone wall or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it, it's like uh, it wasn't Sunday morning. No, it was the beginning of the first day of the week. And that's when he, he wasn't getting up to rest. He was getting up to go back to work. Hmm. You know, it's the first day of the week. Uh, he waited until the end of the Sabbath. Yeah, because he was put in the tomb three days and three nights before that at sunset.
or just before sunset, and then three days and three nights later, he was resurrected. So, the prophet of uh, the prophet of Yona, which is uh, a word in Hebrew that means dove, Yona, and uh, that's very interesting too, because that's another sign of the spirit of Yahushua. Yeah. Wow. Well. I guess we're going to have to wrap it up because uh, yeah. Alice is getting sides. <laughs> she's people calling all over the world now. She's ringing you from the other room. <laughs> no, that's not her. That's uh, <laughs> probably from uh, you know yeah. the space station, or maybe they're uh, down in Australia. Don't get, don't give me any ideas. That's a good idea. <laughs> I can just call from another room. You oh, got a mobile? You got a mobile? Ring from the mobile. Yes, she does. She has a mobile. I will yeah. use one of those things. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you, you. Huh? Sorry. I was going to say, uh, what were you going to say? I was going to say, uh, if there's any more questions or we can go into the profits a bit more next week or we'll see. Uh, see yeah, if, there, if there's a specific question, maybe we can answer that. But in general, I don't think anybody can. Uh, reasonably say, yeah, let me just do a rundown on these. And that. But uh, here's uh, one way that we can tell whether a prophet is from the south uh, or the north and who they're speaking to. If they walk up to you and they use the word y'all, then they're from the south. <laughs> I don't know. Y'all, when we're here in the United States, when we hear someone say, uh, well, how do y'all think about this? What do y'all think? Then that's a, a sign that they're southern, you know. In fact, there was a there's a joke where a, a state trooper, a police officer, walks walk pulls a car over. He walks up to the window of the of the driver and says, "Got any ID?" And the driver says, "About what?" <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, we have uh, we have fun with the south and the north here. Yeah, but anyway. Oh, we didn't get to we didn't get to chat about the POTUS either. Oh, the what? The POTUS. He's in Australia. Mr. Oh, is he? Uh, yeah. Well, y'all can y'all can keep him over there for as long as you like. <laughs> yeah. And, and whenever we say whenever the government is busy doing something or they can't get along, we figure that they can't hurt us. Yeah. Because they're too busy arguing with each other, so they yeah. can't bother us. It's when they get things done that we're harmed. You know? yeah. No, no disrespect to the office, though. You know. Yeah. But as long as he's off the uh, off the turf and he's not here, then we're probably better off. And uh, because we, actually, we probably like to just have him just keep doing what was already done instead of this new stuff that they're trying to do. But uh, <laughs> yeah. anyway. Yeah. Do you have a favorite president? Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. Abraham Lincoln was, uh, he knew who his enemy was. Yeah. Uh, as we read, I've, I've even quoted some of his words, but he's got a lot more to say. But uh, he knew that it, the enemy of the United States was Rome, and Rome was uh, upset with the United States being here because of the, the Constitution is the enemy. Uh, the Constitution controls the government, and they're not all, they're not for governments being controlled at all. They want, they want the government to be dictating everything, uh, controlling the schooling and the upbringing of the children, and it's getting to where it's uh, pretty much that way here. Everything is uh, dictated to us, you know, and uh, what we believe, uh, they won't let people say things, because when the truth gets out, see, the Pope doesn't want us to say the name of the Creator. And why would that be? Well, um, it's because it's an identity. It identifies who he is. And so if the uh, dragon gives authority to the beast, and the beast doesn't want the, the identification of the true creator to be known, then uh, naturally the papacy would say, you can't, you can't say this name. You can't pray in this name. You can't sing in this name. And you can't worship in this name then obviously the dragon is running that show, you know. But anyway, Abraham Lincoln is my favorite president, you know. And I wish we, he, he had to die, though, but it, it's the uh, fact that the freedom of conscience 
is unconscionable to the Jesuits. Mm. You know, they don't want you to have freedom of conscience. They want you to be told and instructed what to believe and who to worship and how to worship, you know, and what day to worship, you know. Mm. And if you just, if you fall outside those parameters, then you're considered a heretic. And of course, Nazarene have always been that. But we're not haters. We don't hate them. We just say, well, you're misguided. You have the traditions of men that you're trying to enforce, and Constantine's a dead guy. We don't have to listen to him, you know, or all the circus fathers. Yeah. Just bye bye. You know, they've got a mixture, though. You know, of all the of all the circus fathers, I think Epiphanius was one of the best, and he's, you know, got his problems too because some of his his things were le led to horrible ideas, you know, but. That's what happens when people follow men, you know. Mm. You should not follow men. You should yeah. follow only the doctrines that are given in the scriptures, and then you can't go wrong, you know. <laughs> well, uh, how about this outer space? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. You I can hear me coffee in there. <laughs> Making coffee. This spaceship's yeah. got everything. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody's been able to concentrate. There's just been so much uh, action going on behind us. Oh, in the cosmos. Mm. See, this is the new DVD. Yeah, death. There. Ooh, <laughs> creepy. Yes, it is. And uh, if anybody needs any of these, they can just uh, phone us or, inter you know, order on the internet or whatever. Did you get your copy? Oh, you did. Yeah, you watched it. Adam sends them direct. Yeah. Direct little and bird on the email sends it to me. Yes. Well, you know, if you are, uh, are you going to, are you going to put a, a little uh, addition to it like you usually do? I, I always enjoy what you do. Well, you this time around we put, we put the long version on the other channel. And uh, did you get those emails? We put it. We opened up another channel. So we yes. put the whole yes. length, the whole length of it there, and then we put the little upload still on there on the Torah Institute channel. Uh huh. So yeah, it, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, and I like the podcast work too. The podcast work is awesome. Yeah. The audio turned out really well. Yeah, we're going to be on every day very shortly. They're still working out the schedule, so I'm just giving them a few seminars and other things to. Who knows where it can go? Right. Well, thank you for what you're doing and staying up late for this. You know, oh, it's my pleasure. It's wonderful. Yes, it is. Talking to one of the most brilliant minds on the earth. You won't. You won't accept oh. that, but I can say it. I won't accept. <laughs> Listen, I won't accept it. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm certainly not even at my best, but uh, yeah. yeah it, but, you know, the commitment is certainly there. I'd, uh, you know, uh, I, I really do care about the lost and uh, the people that don't understand. And, 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 the, and But I'm really upset about the, the fact that the Nazarene want to argue with each other so much and they aren't, lo they aren't very loving. But we'll, we have to learn that, you know, how to do that. And over, it's overcoming self, you know. Get yourself out of the way and just put someone else first. The lost above all, you know. So, uh, because the, the, on the day that Yahuwah comes in wrath, and those four messengers are released from, you know, where they're waiting, uh, it's going to get ugly, <laughs> you know, because uh, he can kill a lot more people fast. And, uh, of course, the, the beast is going to be tearing some things up too, but, you know, we need to get more love in the world. And if everybody loved one another, there would be no traffic accidents. There would be no one harming anyone else. Everybody would be thinking about their neighbor and their friends more than themselves. And, and even among the Nazarene, more so than ever, we should be thinking of one another more highly. You know, and instead of trying to compete with each other in you know, your ministry, your ministry, it's not anybody's ministry, but Yahushua's. And we should all be cooperating together and 
even the Christian uh, community, I pray for them too, that there be unity, you know, so that they aren't arguing, and, you know, over what day is Sabbath or, you know, <laughs> there's, there's that going on with, among the Nazarene, you know, with the Lunar Sabbath people, you know. And there's all kinds of different divisions. And you know who it is that divides us up. You know, it's the enemy. Yeah, enemy. The yeah. enemy wants to divide us up. Yeah. But anyway, we better let you go. <laughs> yeah. And to go, go to bed. Take care yeah. of those little children. I will indeed. All yeah. right. You have a lovely well, week, mate. We love you. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, yeah. man. Talk, talk.